All right. Well, good morning, NAMI Coastal. Um, my name is Leah Baldwin. I am a licensed clinical social worker that has been invited to lead a discussion today. We're going to talk a little bit about ways to reduce anxiety um, during the stay at home period. Um, we're also going to talk about um, setting goals, things that might be helpful during this time. Um, that you are staying at home. And I also um, wanted to mention, for those of you that will see this presentation and can see this, I am joined by my lovely friend, the NAMI Coastal Llama, um, who, uh, just so you guys know, has made a couple cameo appearances on my calls. Um, so he has gone by Coastal. So this is a very um, sought after Llama and has become my little mascot in all my Zoom calls. So I figured I'd give a shout out for that, which I um, picked him up actually at a, a presentation that I did at your all's quarterly event. So anyway, we will get started. So I have a couple housekeeping items that I'm required to say when I do presentations like this. So just bear with me um, a few minutes. Um, and, you know, this presentation, it'll be for educational purposes only. Um, I am actually an employee of Janssen um, Neuroscience. Um, however, I'm not going to talk anything about medications today. And certainly, if you have questions about medications, I urge you that, that come up during the presentation, I urge you to write them down and take them to your healthcare provider and prescriber. Um, so that they can discuss that with you. And of course, I'm also not going to be providing any medical advice. Um, so we have that out of the way. A um, few disclaimers. Um, I have two cats, Sam and George, who do not like to be quarantined um, in a smaller room. So they kind of run about. So if you see any or hear any animals meowing, um, that is them. And hopefully they won't make an appearance or maybe they will. But just so you guys know, I'm not surprised if uh, cats leap on my background. Um, so at any rate, we're going to get started. So I thought today um, that it would be a really good idea to talk about normalizing feelings um, and ways that perhaps you might be able to reframe some of the situations that you're dealing with currently. Um, so one of the things that's really important and that I find really helpful um, is to be able to name feelings. Um, and I think oftentimes in the stay at home quarantine, however you wanna phrase it, time frame that one of the things that gets lost is the ability to talk with others and kind of normalize what's going on. Um, and so oftentimes if we're sitting at home and feeling some kind of way, we get stuck with those feelings and we're not sure if it's just us or if it's other people or what's going on. Um, so kind of want to just run down a list of feelings that I have encountered myself or I've encountered working with some others in the community, um, doing calls like this um, for other persons struggling with mental health issues. Um, and a lot of what's come up is anxiety, um, fearfulness, stress, frustration, um, and even anger. Um, and I think sometimes the anger is the hardest because people sometimes aren't aware of what they're even angry about, but they just kind of feel this impending frustration for not being able to do the things that they're used to being able to do. Um, and that's also fueled by a lot of uncertainty. Um, you all know in Virginia right now, um, you know, we have a stay at home order that is apparently supposed to expire on June 10th. And for a lot of us, um, that seems really far away. And so it becomes this idea of what's happening, what's gonna change. And so all the feelings that you're feeling are normal. Um, and then on the flip side, what I've also encountered, which I think is interesting, is people feeling positive and happy um, and gratitude. And so I think that's important to point out too, because there's nothing wrong with either side of the spectrum. Um, I really admire people that can cultivate some happiness in this time. Um, and I've actually learned from a lot of the people that have said that to me through presentations like this to kind of put myself in check. So hopefully, again, that's helpful just to remember that it's okay to feel discomfort um, at any point in time and certainly during this time. Um, I keep telling people that if you don't feel anxious for a few days during this period of time, um, then we need to have a discussion because I think that's just such a common, common feeling. So I want to make sure that um, we talk a little bit, you know, about just that normalization. Um, and so one of the things that might be helpful as you're kind of going through this is writing down emotions and naming them. One of the things that we know is that once you give an emotion a name, 
it actually loses a little bit of power. Um, I like to kind of use the analogy of some alphabet soup where, you know, if you ever had a can of Campbell's alphabet soup, you pour it out. Generally, there's letters in there. They're noodles and they don't make any sense, right? So sometimes that's what happens to emotions. We feel all these things, but we don't know what they are. Um, and as soon as you begin to name, I'm feeling anxious, I'm angry, feeling happy, um, you kind of put it out there in the universe and you can kind of move on with your day a little bit easier. It doesn't always work, but it's certainly a tool that can help. Um, and I always encourage people to write stuff down. So as soon as you wake up, when you get yourself together, um, trying to kind of do a reset and kind of name what's going on can be a good way to start your day. Um, because of course, you know where you're at. Um, if you're feeling super anxious, then that might be a different routine than if you're feeling super happy. So just kind of getting into understanding that piece. Um, the other thing that I think is really important is reframing. Um, I was listening to a podcast, um, I don't know, about a month ago. And it was by Elizabeth Gilbert. For those of you who don't know who she is, she wrote a book called Eat, Pray, Love, which was a movie with Julie Roberts, which I never saw, but I love her. She's pretty lovely. Um, but she was talking about the importance of reframing this time into what she calls a retreat. Um, and so I thought that was really cute. And it's not to dismiss that we are in this place of, again, uncertainty, but trying to reframe it so that it gives you some more opportunity. Um, retreat sounds a whole lot better than quarantine. Um, I have yet to find someone that can um, argue with me on that, um, that it doesn't feel better. So if you hear me refer to something as a retreat, that's what I'm talking about, the stay at home time, pandemic time. Um, because the other thing that I'm also finding is people don't want to talk about it anymore. Like, you know, it kind of becomes that if I hear one more thing about what I can't do or what's going on, or again, uncertainty, I just feel like I'm, I'm going to melt. Um, so I'm using the word retreat, um, just to kind of, again, reframe it in my head and kind of help others perhaps reframe it to some, some different, different feelings and to open themselves up to some different thoughts. So when we talk about feelings, we can't negate that we also have thoughts. Um, and again, common thoughts are, is this ever going to end? What's life going to be like? Um, again, where am I going to go? What am I going to do? Am I ever going to get back to some kind of normal? Um, when will I be able to go back to my support groups? When can I have contact, you know, um, actual face-to-face -face contact with friends, case managers, clinicians, all the things that we used to do. Um, again, that's all normal. Um, and I think one of the things to think about, again, we're talking about reframing, is thinking, yes, this is not going to last forever. Um, that I know. I don't know when it's going to end, but I do know it's not going to last forever. I also know that things are going to be a little bit different. Um, but if you think back upon your life, we've all struggled with difference and change, and most people eventually move through it. And so if you kind of draw back on past experiences where life was a little bit difficult and you recall entering in that and thinking, I don't think I'm going to be able to get through this, and then realizing, oh my gosh, I did it. Um, and so really kind of challenging yourself to, again, when you're thinking of those thoughts that seem to be pretty anxiety producing. And again, those are the, when is this ever going to end? Is it ever going to end? Things are never going to be the same. Those types of thoughts tend to fuel more anxiety. And as you're feeling more anxious, those thoughts get more intense. And as those thoughts get more intense, your anxiety increases. And as your anxiety increases, then you feel more stuck. Hopefully you guys are seeing a little bit of a wheel with that. It takes one thought to generate more anxiety. More anxiety generates more intense thinking. And as that thinking gets more intense, you tend to feel more stuck. And you feel like generally when you feel stuck, you also think I don't have many options. So that can tend to be a pretty negative um, space to be. So another way to think about that is if I start to begin to change the way that I'm thinking, I might be able to shave a little bit off of that anxiety. Um, and each day that I practice some different thinking, perhaps my anxiety will lower just a little bit. So we have the, again, common feelings, common thoughts. Um, and so I wanna really talk to you guys about once you start to identify feelings and thoughts, the next piece of that is, what do I wanna do today, right? What do I wanna do that's gonna add some meaning to my life in a space where I feel like I don't, or I think that I don't have a whole lot of options? Um, because I know a lot of you like me, again, can't go anywhere. Um, perhaps might be able to leave if you're, you know, getting medication, stuff like that, or going to the grocery store, um, maybe that, but it feels, um, most people say they feel trapped. Um, 
And so again, we get caught in that space of, I feel like I can't do anything. So as you're thinking about, again, how you're feeling and how you're thinking, thinking about also things that could be helpful to do on a regular basis. Um, so one of the ways that can be really helpful to do that is again, get up in the morning with some intention. How are you feeling? What are you thinking? What do I wanna to do today? And it doesn't have to be anything big, right? Um, I think most people, um, if you're able to get out, just thinking about maybe walking for five minutes, right? Um, and setting that goal of, hey, I'm gonna get up, I'm gonna check in how I'm feeling, how I'm thinking, and then I'm gonna take a walk or eat breakfast, that type of thing. Um, and don't underestimate the importance of writing down tasks that typically are habitual, like, like eating breakfast. Um, it's oftentimes when we're feeling in these really high times of anxieties that we forget things that are routine and that could be eating breakfast, could be taking medications, um, it could be checking in with yourself, um, it could be doing meditation or something related to your spirituality and faith. Again, all of those things that used to be pretty routine might not be, might not feel so routine anymore. So really getting to the space where again, you're setting goals in the morning um, and thinking about goals and things that are important to you. Um, because again, I think, you know, we tend to just make goals because I don't know, maybe we feel like we need to do something, but we are setting a goal and doing something that doesn't really have much meaning for you personally. So um, thinking about, you know, what do I want to accomplish? Um, and then of course, making it public is a big thing. And, and the reason I say making it public, I mean, you could certainly post it on social media. That's not necessarily what I'm talking about, but telling one other person. Um, so if I have a goal that I'm trying to get back into exercise, I might tell a friend of mine. Um, and the reason, because now you create some accountability. Um, and again, in this time when most of us are spending a lot of time alone, um, we don't always feel like we have someone that can hold us accountable and that we have support out there. So this is a really good way to do a couple things. Not only set a new goal, which is, you know, can be helpful, but also creating an opportunity to reach out to someone, which again, is pretty difficult, um, especially when you're feeling pretty isolated and trapped at times. Um, that can be really difficult. So again, we go back to that goal setting. What is important to you? What do you want to accomplish? And what do you want the final result to be? So just thinking of some really specific um, areas might generate something you know, that is meaningful. And so I would suggest doing that on a regular basis, um, whether it's every day. And again, it doesn't have to be 10 goals. It could be one goal and it could be the same goal for three days. Um, there's nothing better than feeling like you've accomplished something. Um, and that goes on any given day, but certainly while we're kind of in this space of feeling restricted. Um, so another thing, <laughs> excuse me, want to talk about is kind of, come, kind of going back to anxiety um, and, and thinking about that space of anxiety, feeling stuck, and how we generally, when we're feeling anxious, don't feel like doing anything. And the longer you feel stuck, again, the more anxiety. So again, making sure that you're doing something every day, um, whether it's having your own little apartment, house, room, um, dance party, wherever you're at. Um, I think that oftentimes we underestimate the power of music. And so, you know, setting aside some time to listen to your favorite music. These are great opportunities to do stuff like that if you have that avenue available. Um, and really also thinking about reducing um, your exposure to social media. Um, I know sometimes that when you're at home, the tendency is to um, scroll through Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, I don't know, and all this TikTok stuff. I don't know what that is, but um, I see it all the time and I keep hearing it. Um, but I do know that if you're not careful, um, you know, sometimes letting your brain get flooded with all of this information can be anxiety producing. So if you find yourself in that trap of being on social media or even being on the internet for long periods of time, I would set yourself a timer and allow yourself 20 minutes a day. I don't know, it could be 10 minutes, five minutes, whatever you want to allot, but kind of just set aside some time to do that type of stuff and then get back to something else that's not as stimulating to anxiety and stimulating to sometimes negative and fearful emotions. Um, so really think about that. And then the other space that can be really, really, really helpful, um, and I've said this to years for all of the patients and clients that I've worked with, is set aside some worry time. So if you're a worrier, and that worry is really just, you know, this constant, um, 
rotation of thinking. Um, and I have people that I work with that call it the Rolodex because um, old school, and some of you guys might not know what I'm talking about, but way before there were cell phones, um, people used to have Rolodex where, you know, they put them on the desk and it would circle around and it would have all these cards that would flip around. And so people talk about worry and anxiety as being the Rolodex just kind of spinning. So um, one way to get it to perhaps spin slowly or not at all is to actually schedule some worry time. So in the morning after you do your check-in, um, you could sit down and say for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, five minutes, I'm going to worry. I'm going to worry about everything. Um, anything that comes into my head, I'm going to name it, identify it, and let it pass through it. Um, and then I'm going to move on. Um, and I think that when we make space to do some intentional stuff like that, um, it actually over time reduces worry. So don't be scared um, to spend some time sitting um, and leaning in to the anxiety and worry. Um, because I think that if you don't, you spend a lot of time um, being consumed by worry and anxiety. Um, and not that it's not bad to have those emotions, we just don't want you to sit in them and pitch a tent in them all day. Um, we want you to put on those galoshes and move through anxiety um, and move through some of those stressful situations and not sit with them. So that can be helpful. Um, and also really thinking about alternatives. Um, in this time, we generally think about all the things we can't do. Um, and the truth is, there's a lot of things that we can do. And so as you're thinking about, again, going back to your daily goals and things that you want to accomplish, think about things that you're able to do or things that you want to do that maybe you just didn't have the time or the energy to do. Um, I know for me, I like puzzles. I never have time to do puzzles. Um, and I actually just ordered a thousand piece puddle, puzzle. Um, we'll probably get here in December at this rate, but that's something that I can do that I hadn't really thought about. Um, until I myself started reframing some stuff and thinking, what can I do today? Um, I can listen to music. Um, I can call people up and offer support. Um, I can um, go out and exercise. And so kind of flooding my brain with positive things, again, that I can do, kind of helps take away some of that anxiety. And I don't know about you, but anyone that is able to exercise, even though I hate doing it, and I have this fight all the time, I don't want to go, versus you'll feel better. We have this conflict all the time, and I use it like the old Looney Tune current tunes where you have the devil and the angel on the shoulder, and the angel is saying, go do it, and the devil is saying, no, don't do it. So we have this conflict all the time between what we know is good and helpful to do versus what we want to do. Um, however, most of the time after I exercise, and this is not just for me, but for anyone that I talk to, they generally feel better because um, it gets your endorphins going. And when endorphins going and dopamine's going, we tend to feel better. So just keep that in mind as you're trying to brainstorm some ways and things that you can do differently. Um, so a few other things before I close out. Um, power of laughter, thinking about things and laughing hysterically, finding one or two things to laugh about every day. Um, life is way too serious right now um, and way too much going on. If you can find a space to find some laughter, whether you're watching a funny movie, um, I don't know if you have a joke book, or even laughing yourself if you did something silly. Um, I think the other day I accidentally put a complete uh, cooked pizza. I couldn't find it. It was in the freezer. So again, moment to laugh at myself because I'm like, what are you doing, Leah? So, you know, being able to laugh at yourself and find little ways that you can kind of just put a smile on your face um, is really good. Um, and then, of course, looking out, finding podcasts, um, if you're able to, if you're you know, connected to the internet or have it on your iPhone, um, lots of really, really good, inspiring podcasts um, and some apps, um, Calm apps, Headspace, all that stuff. Um, and then um, trying to think there was some other stuff that um, I had written down that I had completely forgot right now. Um, creating a mantra, that's the other one. So creating something in your life that you can repeat on a regular basis. Um, for me, it's this too shall pass. Um, because I know it well and I have to remind myself. So say in the morning, probably say in the afternoon, I might say it 10 times in the evening. So creating a mantra space where you can really begin thinking in a different direction and a mantra is really just, it could be a quote that you've heard, could be something that you say to yourself, could be just a phrase, it could be positive affirmation, truthfully. 
um, something positive that you want to incorporate in your life on a regular basis. Um, so I think if, just to recap, if you can begin to name how you're feeling, tell yourself that what you're feeling is normal and it's okay. Um, check out your thinking on a regular basis, working on setting goals, um, which is probably the most important thing, um, creating a routine and structure in your day, um, and kind of really thinking more in terms of what can, C-A-N, what can I do on this retreat time? Um, and what am I looking forward to doing? Um, I have these regular discussions with people and typically when I end out, I ask people to name three things um, that they're looking forward to getting back to. Um, and I always say, and people always look surprised, and be so excited to get back to work and to face-to-face -face contact with people because I do think, I love what I do and I'm fortunate that we have this platform, but there's something that's missed from being in a room with people. So I am super excited one day, hopefully to meet all of you um, with NAMI Coastal and hopefully we'll have plenty of opportunities to continue these discussions. If you guys have questions or comments, um, please forward them to um, either the email or get in contact with NAMI. Um, and if it's something specific for me, um, I'm happy to share. Um, if you need any resources, got you know lots of workbooks that are online through our choicesinrecovery.com webpage. Um, that you guys can access. Um, so again, really, really um, thankful um, and gracious that I had this opportunity. I hope it's helpful um, and I hope you all have a wonderful day. Thanks so much.